Welcome everyone to First Unitarian Church of Honolulu's virtual space. This is our Pauhana every Tuesday at 6 p.m. We get together and we ask questions and mull around different uh, uh, topics. Uh, today, we're very excited about our guests, but first I just wanna remind everyone, if it's possible, if you could send me any questions you have or thoughts uh, by private chat, it'll keep our guests from having to kind of monitor two things at once and speak more freely. Uh, of course, if, that's, if typing is something you'd rather not do, you can always raise your hand. Uh, and we'll make sure you get uh, heard or just I'll be scanning the room throughout and you can just gesticulate uh, and uh, or just raise your hand and there's a good chance we'll get to you. And if I could ask for people's help, if someone sees somebody else's hand raised uh, and you think I don't see it, there's a very good chance I don't, please just go ahead and speak up or send me a message. Uh, we want to make sure everyone of all different kinds of uh, listening and communication uh, is heard today. So as we always do. So I am very happy to uh, introduce to you our guest today, uh, John Egan, Professor John Egan, over at um, UH Manoa's Richardson School of Law. Uh, without getting too far into it, uh, today we're going to discuss uh, migration matters here in the state and in other places. And so, uh, John, what I usually do is ask everyone the same question, who, who are you and what do you do? So Judge Levinson answered that question in about 20 minutes. Uh, other people answer it in a few sentences, but you take your pick, whatever you want to do. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, John Egan, that's my name. And what I do is I teach immigration law here at the Richardson School. Uh, I've been doing that for about four years now. Uh, had been teaching classes as an adjunct professor for Oh, off and on since 2007. Uh, I'm an immigration attorney. I've been in private practice for about 20 years prior to coming over to the law school. Uh, they were very interested in getting a clinical program in immigration law set up. And because clinical teaching is sort of like trying to get people to learn how to do it in practice, they asked the practitioner to set up the program. So that's what I've been doing for the last three or four years. What that means is that we are using this program to train young law students. Some of them are not so young actually, uh, but train law students to practice immigration law here in the state of Hawaii. Now they can do it anywhere, but we're trying, it's, it's a conscious effort to build capacity here in the immigration domain in the state of Hawaii. We have, uh, you know, we're a small state, we're, we're, our population is not huge, but we are amongst the highest states in terms of percentage of our population that are immigrants. Uh, and, and quite frankly, our immigration bar is still quite small. And in particular, that part of the bar that serves uh, low income and people with from disadvantaged backgrounds is extremely underdeveloped. Uh, so, so that's part of the idea is that we're trying to train uh, young attorneys who have an interest in public service in the immigration sector. So that, that's the goal of the program. So that's what I've been doing. And uh, mm -hmm. so far, it's going reasonably well. COVID has set us back a little bit. I think it set everybody back in, across the board. Um, but we're still taking immigration cases, live cases, taking them to immigration court. Uh, assisting people with their immigration applications, uh, doing consultations, doing work with different community-based organizations around the islands. So that's kind of what I do. I, I won't take 20 minutes. <laughs> See if anybody has questions based on that. Uh, great. Uh, and what, what got you into wanting to do immigration law or did you kind of fall into it or what, what drew you to it? Well, a combination of interest and happenstance, actually. Uh, <clears throat> I had always wanted to do international work. I was really interested in international development. And you might not think that this is a proper place to start a career towards the law, but my undergraduate degree was in international agricultural development. And I thought I was gonna be spending a, a career in the underdeveloped world and helping people figure out how to uh, build livelihoods. Um, I did that for a short while. 
uh, and then got a job opportunity to go to work for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and was working in South Central Africa as a field officer for the High Commissioner for Refugees, working in refugee camps, working in refugee rehabilitation and reintegration in the aftermath of a significant uh, civil war in uh, Mozambique. Uh, and as I was doing this, I realized that just about everybody up the, the, the ladder, so to speak, in the organization were legally trained. Uh, and I began to think about that as, as something that maybe I would be willing or interested in doing. Uh, so I came to Hawaii uh, and went back to school and ended up in law school and, and, and looked at immigration law, which is where uh, essentially in the United States, refugee law is a subset of immigration law. And, and so you have to learn one the other. And that's how I got started. It was, it was falling out from there. Now you say in the U.S. Uh, those two are a subset or one is a subset of the other. Is that not the case worldwide or are they separate uh, schemas uh, in other parts of the world? Well, yes, actually they are, depending on where you're located and what their legal system is and also what the scale of the crisis is. You know, although we're hearing an awful lot about immigration in the news, uh, immigration is not the primary focus of life in America. Whereas if you go to Turkey, they have something like 4 million refugees in Turkey right now. And that country is not nearly as large as ours. So it's all consuming. They, they have agencies that just deal with that issue. Syria, another place where, where you know, more than half of their population is displaced. Uh, Democratic Republic of Congo has displacement uh, three to four million inside their country, a couple of million more outside the country. So in those places, it really becomes uh, such a central issue that you can't, it, it doesn't fit as a subset to anything. It, it's a, a primary concern on the day to day. Yeah, I mean, you raise a really important uh, issue. I mean, right now, there are, isn't it, I've heard before that on any given day right now, there's about a billion people on the move, trying to move from one place to another, just, you know, which is a significant portion of the Earth's population. But I'm not saying they're all refugees, but we are a people on the move, so. Um. Well, I think that number is a little bit high. Um, I, but it, it's definitely in the hundreds of millions. Uh, most recent figures that, that I saw was about 4% of the human population is somewhere in the migration stream. That's a lot of people, oh. uh, a huge number. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you say Hawaii uh, is one of the, the states or one of the areas that has uh, the highest percentage of people in the migration process. Do you know uh, roughly what we're talking about? Like what percentage of the folks who are on these islands are in some form of migration? Well, the, the census gives us a pretty good idea of that. Uh, the most recent census pegs Hawaii at 18 and a half percent foreign born. The national average is 13 and a half percent. And there's only four states that have higher percentages than Hawaii. That's New York, Florida, California, and I think the other one is Arizona. Uh, so we have more, as a percentage, not a, as, a, as a single number, but in terms of percentage, we have more immigrants in Hawaii than they have in, in, in Texas, for example, and, and all the rest of the states. We, we're way up there. What's interesting is that our population is really distinct from the populations in those other states. Uh, the majority, the vast majority of our migrants come from the Asia Pacific region, as opposed to Europe or Latin America or other places. Uh, I think everybody sees that as you walk around the streets, it's, it's an obvious thing to conclude, but, but it does make us a distinct population vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other states. Now, that is, it's true, one of the, one of the things, though, that I wonder if is in reverse, does it mean that 
in a sense, migrants from Latin America here end up going a little invisible? Well, yes, I think that's true. Uh, even when we count the Hispanic population of Hawaii, which again, the most recent numbers are about 9%, about a third of that is actually Puerto Ricans who have been here for years since plantation days. And, and nobody even really thinks of them as anything other. I mean, they eat pasteles, but you know, other than that, they just, they're like everybody else. No one thinks of them as Hispanic migrants. Likewise, we get, you know, uh, a fair number of people from Latin America now. And, uh, you know, like the Brazilians that you see surfing on the, the North Shore, what have you, they really do blend in remarkably well. Where we're seeing some problems, though, um, are some of the most recent immigrants coming from the southern border. Uh, you know, we, we've been seeing this in the news. They, they, they come to the border and some of them get pushed back and are being you know, uh, victimized by crime in Northern Mexico while they're waiting to try to get into the United States for asylum. Uh, we've seen the, the stories about the children being stripped away from their families or mothers and fathers, uh, seen some of the conditions in the detention centers. Well, there's sort of a secondary effect to that that's happening here in Hawaii. And, and it's kind of, uh, as you mentioned, it, it, it's sort of an invisible problem. Uh, some of those people are actually ending up here in Hawaii, you know, after they get processed at the southern border. And, and those people are uh, in need of just about every kind of assistance that you can imagine. Everything from daily sustenance to work opportunities to health care and legal services, because many of them are in the immigration court system. As soon as they come over the border, they get uh, written up with a, an order to go to court. And they don't speak English. They're here. They're kind of invisible in the community. Uh, and, and it's becoming kind of a significant problem. Yeah. One of the things I noticed here is that in, in New York, walking around, just so many of my friends spoke some Spanish, like enough to be aware and to help. Like, I have noticed here that like trying to find people who speak Spanish and can interpret at a level that someone coming from another country is, is really hard. I know that sounds like a silly thing, but the culture here is so different than all the other states you just mentioned that where there are a lot of Spanish speakers who are in service industries or in ways like working with organizations that help migrants. Uh, and it's very hard to find, or it's been hard for me to find Spanish speakers to do that here, so. You know, I think you're absolutely right about that. Yeah. In, in, in California, and California, you know, Spanish speakers are all over the place. The, uh, the problem, I, I would guess that here in Hawaii that you would find more people who their second language after English is Japanese or Chinese or one of the, the Filipino dialects uh, than you would Spanish. Uh, we, we also have that problem here at the clinic. Many of our clients, we've now picked up quite a number of these uh, Central American migrants as clients for our, our clinic. And we have a, a we've been very lucky, honestly, uh, because we have a Spanish language department here at the university, and they have uh, encouraged some of their students to assist us. But the need is bigger than that, actually. We, we struggle with that. that. That's a real issue for us, interpretation and translation. Yeah, I know Mauricio was helping a little bit when he was here, but um, yeah, we, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, most of the things I've, you know, just done a little bit of help here and there with you is sing thing. And I know Nancy Young is on here too, who's helped a little bit here and there uh, has been mostly just driving people to and from the airport um, with enough uh, Spanish to figure out how their day was or something like that. But, um, you know, we have actually been able to uh, in be the beneficiaries of some really helpful support in the community. And you, you named Nancy, hello, I didn't see you here on my screen, but hello. Uh, there's a, a group that organized a, as a sanctuary support group at the Harris uh, Methodist Church. And, and they have really helped us out greatly. Uh, you know, you can imagine some of these people are native Spanish speakers, in some cases, not terribly well-educated, 
from rural areas, getting on an airplane is sort of a, a, an obstacle that they have to get over. Uh, and then they get to Honolulu from the Kona airport and they have to figure out how to get to the immigration court in order to show up in time for their hearing. Uh, and, and the Harris team have been excellent in, in giving us support on that. It's really been an amazing bit of community outreach. And, and you know, quite aside from the, 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 uh, the support that it gives us at the clinic, I think it's a really outstanding way to show community support for these newcomers. Uh, that people care enough to actually get involved and help strangers manage their way through the complicated and somewhat intimidating process of dealing with our immigration system. Yeah, I remember, yeah, some, some stories. I was nervous once and trying to get uh, one client to the airport because she was meeting at your office. I don't know if I ever told you this. I accidentally locked my keys in my house. So mm -hmm. I couldn't take her to the airport. So, and she was pregnant. And cause I let her, you know, she had to, she was pregnant. So she used the bathroom. And then, so I ended up calling an Uber and the only Ubers that were available was an Uber, an Uber X. Like, and so a, like a, a luxury class Mercedes pulls up uh, to take us both, <laughs> both to the airport. And she didn't know, as you Lisa, and she was like, what, who are you? What is going on? Why do you have <laughs> And so I was trying to explain that I don't have a driver and it's not I've this, it's that I'm stupid that we have this, uh, this driver today. But these are some of the ways we, we just try to do our part, right, John? That's right. Um, now I'm trying to remember which case that was. And uh, I think I have some good news for you. I think we won her case. Oh, good. How's the baby? Uh, well, here and thriving. Good. Uh, well, thriving in Kona. Thriving in Kona. Yeah, and I we do have some questions about some more sort of policy questions, but I did want to draw attention a little bit to, and I know some people may know this and some people may not, but I mean, one of the big areas, we have some folks on the, uh, on the call who live on Big Island. And so I just wanted, if you could just say a word or two about why this migration is happening, especially in Kona and Big Island. And, and uh, could you say something about sort of why, why this is, what, areas are attracting folks or where they're working that's leading to this kind of uh, this kind of need? Well, that's actually very interesting. I, I think that this is something that should be a little bit more widely known. Uh, we have had people from Central America arriving on the Kona side of the Big Island for about 35 years. Uh, and they've been attracted for one particular reason is that there's work available there in an industry that they're already familiar with. As you know, Hawaii is the only state in the union that has a, a, a fully fledged coffee growing industry. And it resonates with people coming from Latin America that, that uh, on the Central American countries in particular are, you know, that's a dominant part of their economy. So what has happened is this group of core group of, uh, of people who first started arriving uh, 25, 30 years ago, and, and slowly building up, um, those people were pretty well settled, pretty well integrated into the, the communities on the Kona side. Uh, and then this crazy situation at the southern border happened and completely overwhelmed the capacity of the Customs and Border people and all of the, the different organizations that were at the border. So what they started doing is when someone would come across, they would ask them, do you have a relative in the United States? And if the answer is yes, they take their telephone number and call them and say, will you take this person in and take care of them while they're going through their proceedings? So it's really the, the original seed population was drawn there for the coffee industry and has, you know, to some degree successfully integrated themselves into the community not to say successfully integrated into the immigration system, because many of those people after 25 and 30 years are still undocumented, but they find work. Uh, the way that there's a certain informality in the way coffee is uh, harvested and, and weighed out and paid by the pound. Uh, so, so it fits that kind of uh, a cash uh, employment relationship. 
So the coffee industry is really what has drawn these people in. Uh, and and it's, it's, we identify coffee as sort of an iconic product here in Hawaii. Uh, but I think there is um, not a complete accounting for what it takes to produce that. I mean, and that's true the world over. Um, the, uh, I, when I took one of the, one of the guys uh, I was working with out, a lot of times for folks who don't know, when, when we finish a proceeding and John has other work to do or other people do, sometimes we have a few hours to kill before the flight. And so a lot of times we go to Ala Moana and we get ice cream or, or we uh, go to the beach. And I took a 17 year old boy and two of his uh, friends and uh, he really wanted to pay for lunch. And I was like, no, I got it, I got it. He took a wad of cash out of his, uh, his pocket you know, to pay for uh, what it was. And, and I was like, oh, this definitely is a cash uh, thing. And I was like, you really should not take that out at Alamoana Center. Please leave that uh, <laughs> where it is. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was quite remarkable. Um, uh, but yeah, I wanted to, there, there are some other questions that maybe we could turn a little bit to your expertise in the UN and some other areas as well. But uh, one person is kind of asking if you could have a comment about any intersectionality between sort of colonialism and colonial policies and, and how people now are displaced from ancestral homes and whether that kind of movement is still happening or, or if there's a history of that that you still, still see playing out on the world stage today um, or you know, whatever your take is on that. Yeah, well, that's a big question. And, and if I wanted to sort of keep it narrow to the conversation we're having about Central America, uh, I think it's not coincidental whatsoever, the colonial history that, that our country, the United States, has had with Central America. Uh, you know, we, you, you've heard the term the Banana Republic, right? Well, that refers to Honduras. Uh, and that country was owned and operated by United Fruit Company for generations. They, they basically were the people who were uh, putting the government into power or taking them out, depending on, on their predilections. Uh, so so the, the sort of corrupt power structure in Honduras is a legacy issue of, of colonialism that was based on a commercial interest of the United States, no question about that. And it continues. Uh, likewise, Guatemala had uh, you know, a, a reasonably functional government that was overthrown by the US government. Uh, but more recently, you know, there's a, a really interesting, interesting dismaying, you know, disheartening uh, phenomenon in Latin America. One of the reasons so many people are coming up is because of the huge impact of, of the narcotics cartels and the gangs that are uh, really displacing civil authority in many parts of Central America. Those gangs uh, were started in Central America from young Latin Americans who were deported from Southern California. They, got, they were in Southern California as unlawful immigrants uh, probably came to America, the migration at that time was as a result of, you know, the wars that, for example, the war in Nicaragua, for one, uh, you know, things that, that really had been, uh, if not instigated by, certainly exacerbated by American colonialism in Central America. So they get displaced, they get to the United States, they're essentially alienated, they're, they have a, a really difficult time integrating into the community. So they turn to gang structures to uh, you know, try to protect themselves and develop whatever kind of economic livelihoods they can. Now that's nothing new. That happened to the Italian immigrants. They started the mafia. You know, the Irish had their own gangs. The Jewish people in, in New York had gangs. I mean, you get here as immigrants and if they won't let you in, you start gangs. That's just how that works. Uh, so these kids came to LA, found that they were getting, you know, pretty tough life on the streets of, of LA and formed gangs. They get deported. They introduce the gang culture to Latin America about 25, 30 years ago. 
And now they are so powerful down there that people are running away from the gangs that were seeded into Latin America by our deportation policies. So, you know, if you want to talk about colonialism and the lingering effects and how it, it echoes and reverberates back, uh, boy, there, there's a, a really interesting case study that, you know, some people are studying this now, but, but it, there's a big story in there, really big story. Yeah, when you start looking at anything over that course of more than a generation, and you start looking at what really has transpired with two different kind of generations, one growing up and then one coming up under that generation that set the structure, you, you wonder how is it going to go? It's just going to keep getting bigger and keep proliferating, or is there some sort of containment or management that might happen? And with this one, it seems like, um, I mean, it raises a point that... Uh, that people may not be aware of, which is especially for young men escaping uh, parts of Central America, that one of the legitimate cause reasons that uh, they can't go back is that they'll either be put into the gang or they'll be killed. If you, if you don't join the gang, you're, you're executed and your family could also be harmed. I mean, can, isn't that right? I mean, that's one of like the, the main reasons people come here is simply to escape the, the gang life, right? Yeah, absolutely. We have a handful of cases where that's when you strip away all of the rest of the conversation. The reason that they're here is that if they stayed, they would either have to join the gang, which they don't want to do, uh, or, you know, be victimized by the gang. It's one, yeah. join us or die. Yeah, that's a pretty terrible choice. What's also very dismaying about that and I don't think people really quite understand this, is that fundamentally that problem doesn't fit very well with American asylum law. Right. Uh, that, that the U.S. government has taken a fairly hard line to say that, you know, that doesn't fit within of an asylum claim. That's just crime. You don't get asylum for being a victim of crime. You have to be persecuted on one of these protected grounds. Uh, I mean, that's a little bit more than we probably want to get into tonight, you know, to explain how all of that works. But the, the idea is you have crime in your country. Well, we have crime in our country too. Why, why would you get to come here because you have crime in your country? Well, it's a little bit more than that. Believe me, what's going on down there. Does it frustrate you as a, as a, and I know we have other, uh, we actually have a few lawyers that I can just see from <laughs> just in the, just in the uh, thing here's four lawyers just on the screen. But as a lawyer, does it frustrate you what you just talked about, the colonial argument, not being able to stand up and make the argument to a government that created the very situation uh, that's making these people flee? I mean, does that kind of argument ever carry itself, maybe at least in the, in the circuit courts? Like, do you ever even get to get in in a brief or do people just go, don't even tell me about colonialism. Let's just deal with the facts at hand. Like, where where do you make that structural argument, or can you? It doesn't fit well into an administrative court context. You know, you're absolutely right. Now, what, what's also very frustrating is that that framing of what is or what isn't immigration law is very much domestic. On the international scale, many other countries are recognizing these kinds of issues as being legitimate uh, bases for, for making an asylum claim. In fact, the uh, Inter-American Inter uh, Council, the, the, the large international association of, I think it's the OAS, the Organization of American States, has specifically stated, and that's part of their policy, that civil disorder and civil breakdown can be recognized as uh, bases for asylum. The United States very specifically said, no, that doesn't apply to us. Uh, so, so that's also a very frustrating thing. Uh, I, I really, you, you talk about things that are frustrating and, and daunting. Uh, those are, are the issues. You, you're forced into a, a, a very narrowly framed box to, to argue these claims. They're controlling how that works. It's getting a little bit better right now, honestly. 
Um, the last administration was horribly harsh. Uh, and this administration is a little bit better. I was hoping that it would be a lot better. Uh, but at this point, it's a little bit better. Yeah. I think uh, this administration gets a lot more credit for less movement than people realize is really being made in this area. That's my personal political opinion, but anyway. Um, uh, but this also raises a, a, another issue that is important to a lot of the folks on here and in these lands. I mean, you may not know this, but we have a, we have a sibling congregation in the Philippines. And in just the time I've been at the church, the water uh, at their shore has risen a number of feet and is getting pretty close to the church itself. We, we had a Pauhana like this with them and they just turned their camera around from the church and we could see the water coming up. Um, and there was another thing. So they're looking at moving up a mountain uh, right now. Uh, and so what, what do climate refugees, especially here in Hawaii uh, and around start to play into this as well? Are you seeing some of that where you are? Yes, uh, you know, not to continue to harp on Central America, but that's also part of the problem down there. There, there are climate change in Latin America is pushing migrants off their lands because the crops that they used to grow no longer grow there or the water that they were using or expecting the rainfall has the, the, the patterns have changed so radically in just the last 20 years that they're just out of luck. They can't grow what they used to grow. Uh, here in the Pacific Islands though, I mean, this is, you, know, you mentioned the Philippines, well, every, every island between here and the Philippines is going to be impacted by this. Now it's interesting. I, I wish she was still here in, in town. We have a, a scholar here at the law school, Maxine Burkett, who, uh, who really specializes in the law of climate change and the law of migration related to climate change. We call them climate refugees. But again, the way refugee law is framed in the United States, there is no such thing as a climate refugee because it isn't persecution and it doesn't relate to their political opinion or their religion or their ethnicity. Uh, so they can't possibly be inside refugee law. So there is the other problem. We, we need a whole new definition of a refugee law to deal with this climate change issue. Uh, she's an expert on that. And, and you know, to give her a little plug, she's currently on leave from the University of Hawaii to be a, a consulting expert for the Biden administration in Washington, DC. But she's, this is what she does. That's, that's her whole field. It's big, it's coming. And again, you wanna talk about something, you know, where there's, complicated causation. Well, why are we having climate change? One of the big reasons is carbon. Who are the biggest carbon producers? United per capita, United States, because we all drive and we all, you know, do all the things that we do, air conditioning, whatnot. Uh, so we have some culpability in the generation of climate change. Are we willing to take responsibility or our own culpability by opening up to those people who are displaced in part, I mean, not fully, I don't think I understand climate science to say it's one for one, but we have had a big impact on the acceleration of the change of the climate because of the American lifestyle, because of American prosperity. And are we willing to take some responsibility in looking at climate migration as something we ought to be concerned about. We ought to be dealing with it in some way. And, and I'm not seeing any broad recognition of that responsibility uh, across the board. I, I'm just not seeing anybody who's saying, yeah, we caused that, we're gonna step up and deal with it. I'm just not seeing that. Yeah, there's a, there's a cynic in me that misses the Old Testament days when everyone could agree that weather was an act of God and that that's, and so everyone had to protect one another because you never know what was gonna happen. We've gotten smart enough to take God out of the weather 
to say, no, 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 God doesn't have anything to do with that. That's, that's us. We're super powerful. Ah, but we don't want to have any responsibility now that we figured out that it's, we're so powerful that we can do it, but uh, stay tuned for our next sermon. But anyway, uh, <laughs> it's an awful convenient uh, situation. Uh, so, um, well, yeah. there's an interesting analogy to that, you know. Yeah. You talk about this idea of an act of God, that th this disaster that's happening is caused by some supernatural power. Uh, well, that's what the word disaster means, you know. Yeah. It's disastrum, you know, uh, bad stars, that that's how you get a disaster. It's, it, it doesn't have anything to do with us. It's got to do with bad stars. Well, that's pretty much been disproven. Anybody who is really paying attention to uh, disaster management and all of those sort of issues realize that basically we're getting the disasters that we choose to allow. That, that's how disasters work in the modern world. We know what these effects are and we know where the vulnerable populations are and we're not stepping up. And, and what would it take? I mean, what's the... What's the image? Is it a, a new policy? Is it a new take? Is it, is it, do you think on the, I know a lot of people in the environmental world, it's sort of a, they're on one hand trying to change one heart at a time, and on the other hand, trying to change policies. And it just feels like they're beating their head against a wall. Like, where do you come out in the, in the balance of things like uh, helping one person at a time versus trying to get a court to make a new policy versus, I mean, or is it just the total tonnage or What's your, where are you drawing hope or where do you see the, the possible shifts happening? Well, I would, if you're talking to an immigration attorney and asking for hope, you're, you're probably digging in the wrong well. Uh, there, there's a lot of problems that are not getting better in, in a short time frame. And, you know, speaking personally, if you want a personal perspective, Please. My view is that every person has to do what they feel they're capable of doing. Uh, and for some people, that's, I mean, like a minister, for heaven's sakes, you, you, you realize that your uh, capacity and your, your vocation is dealing with groups of people. I'm not so good at that. I, I take one case at a time and I plug that case and I work my tail off to try to make that case work. Uh, but I think both are needed. You know, there, there isn't, there is no level on this scale that gets to be ignored. It has to happen at every level. And, and all I can say is, I think I know how to do this work. So that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. It's, uh, and I've told you this probably more times than you can count. And I've told it to other people too, but you know, I really, I really feel like I've seen people try to work in a not-for-profit law per se and all this kind of areas um, and get burned out. And I know immigration law can do that too, but if anyone's got young people looking at something, want to have some kind of meaning and also maybe make kind of a living, being a, a moderately capable, honest immigration lawyer is about the best thing you can do for the world, uh, at least for this country. And, uh, it's, and it's a way to actually also support a family and I mean, it's really one of the, one of the, and it, so can you say something about, at the very beginning, you talked about something I wanted to come back to, which is building a bar here, building capacity in a place in the fourth most by percentage place with people in migration. And I would argue comparatively, if it is just like a lot of other things in Hawaii, very high in one area and very low in the thing that's supposed to support it. I'm guessing Hawaii probably has the highest disparity between number of people in migration and number of, shall we say, competent, honest uh, immigration lawyers. Am I, do you think I'm wrong about that or am I close? Uh, it sounds very familiar. Let me put it down. <laughs> it's a problem that, that's, that I'm very familiar with. Uh, you know, for years, honestly, uh, immigration was not a high status part of, of practicing law uh, and still isn't in, in many areas. Uh, you know, immigration lawyers were maybe a small step above ambulance chasers. Uh, but that has really changed a lot. The, the, the more 
the policy is revealed as being uh, so unequal and, and so lacking in due process, uh, so lacking in fundamental fairness, it has drawn people to, to the practice that might otherwise not be uh, inclined or, or may not observe that this is a, a true need. You know, the other thing that's happening that's, that's really interesting is immigrants and children of immigrants being attracted to the bar. Yeah. And, and boy, that's probably the most hopeful thing I've seen in recent times. Uh, but even so, it, it takes a certain sort of person. You know, I, I'm not complaining about my life. Uh, I, I'm, that's not what I'm trying to say, but there, nobody that I know got rich doing immigration law. Uh, you know, you can make a living, but you, you're not making tons of money. And, and some people, that's why they go into the law or any other profession, you know, that there are opportunities to really move your family up the economic scale. And that's not a, a, that's not a bad motivation. If, if you're coming from modest means and you want to improve your family's prospects to get into a profession and, and succeed. But immigration law is not someplace you're going to get rich. So you have to have a reason for wanting to do it. And, and for the young people that we're training now, I'm seeing a lot of them that are really highly motivated to do public service as their career, or if not as their full-time job, to make sure that they've incorporated it into their pro bono practices. So, so that's a hopeful thing. I, I, you know, I, I don't want to be uh, too much of a cynic here. If, if there's one really good thing that I can see coming in, in immigration, it's this next generation of people who are part of the immigrant experience, uh, who have that family history that informs their practice. Uh, because I think that's going to turn things around in a big way. I really do. Yeah, I have a friend who is a, uh, who's married to a woman from uh, Costa Rica, but he's a partner in the Vincent and Elkins defense contracts uh, practice. So he knows a lot of the yucky, yucky lawyers uh, out there and knows how to deal pretty nastily, but he takes pro bono immigration cases. So when they see the Vincent and Elkins uh, letterhead coming across the desk, they, things get, things get moving. So it's sort of, even in his like area, he feels called to do this. And even they, the, his office loves that he takes care of almost all their pro bono hours. So that's um, great. But yeah. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of people motivated to do this now that maybe in the past might've taken another career path. Yeah. So that's a good thing. So now, but you've made the move to, to teach. Can you say something about that calling or like that idea of training the next generation? Was it sort of like, were you always a teacher? Was it always something you enjoyed? Or was this more of a, we, I know we need to do this, so I'm going to make myself do it. Like what, can you say something about that transition? Well, yes, I have been doing it for a while. You know, I, I started doing uh, teaching right in graduate school. Uh, and then soon after getting out into practice, I was coming back and teaching adjunct professor, lecturer sort of uh, you know, classes here at the university. Uh, and I've taught in other departments as well as, as law. Uh, so I, I've always enjoyed teaching. Uh, I, I don't consider myself to be a professional teacher. Uh, I really consider myself to be a, a professional lawyer, a practitioner who is trying to impart the, the sort of ethos uh, of practice to students. Um, so I, I, you know, I don't write academic articles. Uh, I, you know, I rarely would go to uh, academic conferences to present. That's just not what I do. It, it, fortunately, clinical, uh, clinical teaching allows you to teach what you know and what you do. Uh, and, and I find that to be really satisfying, really fulfilling. Um, and yes, I mean, you can kind of look and see, I, I earned all this white hair. 
Uh, and so, yes, there was a, a part of this, which was, okay, I had a 22 year lawful, you know, uh, legal practice. Now let's do something to share that out, to, to, to bring on some of the younger folks in the next generation. And, and so, yeah, I, I think that's in there, you know, a, a motive to share what I have learned during this career with the next generation before I uh, am too old to, to stand anymore. That's good. So it's sort of like an associate model. Like, you know, for those of you who don't know the way a law firm works, like you have partners, sort of mid-level associates and brand new associates who are just the worst, uh, but you... <laughs> But you have to teach them to do something to to uh, afford the bill that are the afford the salary they're all earning. So it's sort of like you're taking sort of pre junior associates and sort of that teaching model of like bringing them up to speed, getting them doing things. Like is that how the clinic works? Like they do drafts of things and you look at it and you do changes and you strategize together, things like that. Exactly. We we, we try to get every person who comes to the clinic to learn how to do motions. To learn how to draft a, a, a brief or a memorandum. Uh, and we try to get them actually into court. We, we take students right into the immigration court and have them uh, doing the actual trial practice. So, so that's been really, I think, helpful. Uh, you know, I mean, you're a lawyer yourself, so, so you have some sense of this. Uh, many law schools are a little bit slim on the actual practical training part. Really? Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> you know about this. Yeah. Uh, but in, I mean, if you think about the way we, we train doctors, for heaven's sakes, they, they spend two years in the classroom and then spend two years in the hospitals doing this stuff, you know, and, and their, their theory, I mean, my wife is a physician, so she tells me these things, but they, they were very clear. You take the scalpel, you watch someone do it, and then you do it, and then you teach the next person how to do it. And, and that's medical clinical practice. Well, I think lawyers should be doing something kind of similar. I mean, everybody should be getting out of law school, having a better sense of how this stuff actually gets done. Uh, and, and so uh, that's a lot of what we do here in, in immigration law clinic. We have some other clinics too, so, so they're getting some in other spaces, but I, I think it should be a, a integral part of law school education to actually do the work. And, and, and there's no way else you really learn some of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, if I had my way, not to get all lawyery, but like, I, I'd much rather hire someone if I saw their brief than their grades. Like, I, it makes... And, and a law school writing sample is just not the same thing. Like a clinical writing sample that they actually had to argue and they can tell me the story about and how they put it together and everything. That's much more interesting to me. Uh, and I know for any even mid-level firm who's got any care about their bottom line, knowing they've got someone who they can just start putting in who can write and do that uh, makes a huge difference. The other thing it does is it flattens the it flattens the privilege curve, to be totally honest. Like you, the clinical side prevent, I'm sorry, I'm just pontificating now, but by putting more of an emphasis on the clinical work, it opens the opportunity from the people who didn't, to the people who maybe didn't have the same kind of access to outlines and the other things people do to inflate their grades in law school. If you can write, you can write, you know, that's, and I realize there's some privilege there because like, obviously there's some teaching that might've gone uh, with that and everything. Um, so anyway, I think having more emphasis on the practical ends up giving a lot more opportunities to people who might not have had them in the current scheme of the way employment after law school works. But, um, and, you know, just getting into law school is a kind of privilege. Um, now, we've got a much more diverse student body than most schools. Um, and, and I wouldn't say that being privileged is inherent in being a, a student at the Richardson School, but there is a privilege in just getting the opportunity to go to law school. So another really interesting benefit of the kind of work we do is students see what really underprivileged people confront when they have a legal problem. 
that that whole relationship between uh, not being part of the system and yet being subject to a very complicated uh, and biased sort of legal structure without an advocate. Uh, and, and I think that opens some people's eyes up. Yeah. You know, another thing we do, we, we take the students, we were in Kona last weekend. Uh, we, we brought students over to, to meet with our clients in Kona. And when we do that, we try to also move them around the neighborhood a little bit. You know, let's see where these people actually live. Some people are really surprised to find out that, you know, here in the paradise state, that there's rural poverty, that there are people living in shacks uh, on dirt roads. Uh, you know, that, that surprises some people, you know, people who are living in, in structures that have no uh, actual address. Uh, and that's where they raise their families. Uh, it's a really eye-opening experience to, to get people to understand that, yes, actually a career in the law has the potential to help rise up some of these people who are in situations that are distinctly underprivileged. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, we actually have an interesting question here. I don't know how much emigration work you do. Do you help people who are trying to leave for, for a particular reason at all? Or have you seen a, a movement? Uh, this question is about the diaspora of Black Americans emigrating to uh, African nations uh, to, in some measure. Have you seen any of that work? Well, they don't need my legal help. Right. You know, because the doors are open, you can leave. Uh, but it is interesting, the more you study migration, you know, I think many Americans have a, a very sort of myopic view. You know, they believe that people come here for the American dream, that once you step foot on American soil, boy, you would never leave because there's no place better than this. Well, actually about 30% of all immigrants ultimately go home. People don't know that. And the people who study this, the demographers call it circular migration. Uh, and this has been true from the beginning of, of American immigration. Uh, you know, you get here and maybe you don't make it. Maybe you're not able to learn the language. Maybe you find out that American food just doesn't taste as good as what your mother used to cook at home. Maybe you're not able to achieve your dreams. Uh, but that whole idea that, that migration is a one way opening door is not true. You know, the idea of people leaving to go to other places. Now, I haven't really focused on that in particular uh, ethnicities. I, I, I spent some time working in Africa, but I don't know very much about African migration patterns. Uh, Likewise, the Pacific Islands have a, a very strong history of this circular migration. People come and then they go home and they, they might do that two or three times in their lifetime. Uh, and, and they may end up back home when, they're, when it's time to retire. So, so yeah, this, this, this is, it's not a one-way thing. Emigration is a real thing uh, and probably understudied and under understood. Um, thanks, John. I, I know that we have two other members of the uh, Hawaii Immigration Bar on the, on the call, and we have five minutes left. I just wanted to give each of them a chance to add something if they'd like or say something, uh, if there's anything they wanted to say, even if it's just thank you, John, for all you do. But uh, Kevin or Claire, do you, uh, do you want to say anything or add anything or ask a question? You can just unmute and start if you want. Um, I don't even see Claire, but so I'll go. Uh, hey, I'm Kevin Block, and thanks, John. Um, John's one of my mentors, and um, and uh, TJ. You know, for a man of the cloth, he walks the walk. Like he's come to court with me a couple times and just stared down the judge with, you know, like that. His God is watching look, and it's super effective and come with me to ice. So shout out to TJ for all that help. 
Yeah, and I just, I mean, so much of what you said, John, I was, I was actually wrote in the chat about climate my refugees. So I think you covered it. I mean, I, I think it's, you know, the situation in in the Big Island is is intense right now, and we're getting lots of um, of climate refugees, people whose land is no longer farmable, and they're starving. Like I have a, I had a consult with a person who was left because they were starving uh, because their farm doesn't work anymore. And I also loved that you mentioned building capacity in the immigrant community. I think that's where the next crop of lawyers is, is going to come from that's motivated to do the work. And so, yeah, you said it all. And, um, and I love our immigrant bar and I love this church for, for being interested in supporting us. So that's all I got. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, Claire. Do you want to say anything? Hi. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Okay, great. Hi, my computer doesn't like Zoom. No, I really don't have anything to add except thank you, John. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, all of you who are interested enough to uh, log in and learn more. And thank you, TJ, uh, for organizing and hosting this. I really, all the bases were covered. Um, I'm just grateful um, that you're all, that you're all out there and that you care. Um, so so thanks for that. And John, you're amazing. I could listen to you all the time. <laughs> so thank you. You should join my classes then. Because <laughs> they can't get they can't get away from me fast enough. I I grew up in a household with a lawyer just like you. So to me, it's very warming. I, I know more about patent law than I ever wanted to know. And like my friends would come over and be like, your dad is so cool. He knows all this nerdy stuff. And I'm like, but you don't have to listen to it over and over, but now I, it's all I love listening to. So um, it's, uh, it's wonderful having you. Uh, the thing I always ask uh, people sort of as we're departing is what, what can we as little individuals or a, a modest sized church, what can we do to help? What is there that, um, that you would say, or that what we should be doing to make ourselves more aware or somehow help in some, in some way? Hmm. Well, that's, you know, we, we talked a little bit about this idea that whatever you're capable of, that's what you need to be doing. Uh, and the, again, you know, this idea that, that Kevin and Claire both just mentioned, the fact that you're interested enough to be here and listening to this is great. Uh, <clears throat> you know, if you have a little bit of spare time, check in with Nancy. The, she's part of the the sanctuary team, they know what they're doing. They're doing a really good job of support. They assist people with their actual daily needs, getting to and from uh, court, getting to and from their ICE check-ins. Uh, they're giving people real support in the, in the real world, as the, the kids say, in the real world, they're doing good work. Um, if you have finances, you got a few dollars to spare at tax time, uh, donate to these organizations that are doing the work. The, the legal clinic, I think you've spoken with Esther Yu here before. Uh, they're doing really good work. Uh, you can donate to our clinic. You just find us on the website. You push that little donate button. You can give us whatever you choose to. Um, if you want to step it up a little bit and you are an attorney or, or have professional capabilities, uh, contact us and we can find work for you to do. Uh, we've had volunteer attorneys from the, the Hawaii bar uh, step in and take cases with a mentor. Kevin and Claire have done mentoring with, with some of these cases. We can do that as well. Uh, so, so yes, all of that is, is helpful. Um, there is a couple of, of bills going through the legislature right now. Uh, one is to, to assist with funding for organizations like the legal clinic. Um, you know, so, so, there are ways to support it in the political scene. Uh, but the fact that you're interested is, is really a, a good place to start. And if you want more information, uh, I, I'm pretty sure TJ knows how to reach me and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not hiding. So if you wanna help, let me know. Great, I was just letting everyone know, I'll be sure everyone finds out what those bill numbers are and I'll announce it on Sunday if you wanna do some some calling. We've gotten very good at calling people to schedule schedule hearings and to uh, make people let people be know how we're how we're feeling about particular bills. John, it's one of the big oh, things we've done this year. Um, so yeah, I uh, 
I, I have a policy of beginning and ending things on time whenever possible. So I wanna say uh, thank you so much uh, for being here with us and for all of your insight, for all you do. Um, really, it's a, it's a joy to learn so much um, from someone who does so much. So uh, thanks so much for being with us, John. TJ, it's always a pleasure talking with you. Yeah, you too. All right, have a wonderful night, everyone. Okay, I love